this is going to be fun, I think. Anne and Gary are here. They'll, they'll be correcting me because last year about this time, the three of us put this on. It was a bit longer and a bit different. We divided it up. But um, because of different circumstances, I'm doing it this year. So they'll sit there and they'll, you know, grade me. So it'll be interesting. Um, before, I, we're going to do a quick quiz. But um, I want to tell you how far I've come. When I first started in the plant and insect clinic, people would bring in spiders. And I was working with another fellow then. I'd say, OK, Tom, this one's yours. You do it. And he would look at the spiders. And pretty soon, I could look at them under the microscope if somebody else had them under the microscope. And I could look at them, you know, blown up big, big picture on the screen. And then pretty soon, I could sit down and kind of look at them, you know, really close. And then I got really brave. We would freeze them or, or put them in alcohol. And when you do that, they get drunk. Freezing doesn't work so well because they get mushy. But if you put them in um, alcohol, they kind of get drunk and they go to sleep. They don't move. So one of the other master gardeners and I were sitting there. We had this great big giant house spider under the scope. And we're looking at it. We're trying to, I'll tell you about this later. We were counting the eyes to try to identify what it was. And it was about, oh, about 11 by 14 on the screen. I mean, it, we had it magnified. It was big. And the damn thing moved. I'll tell you what. I nearly hit the ceiling. I screamed like a little girl. And it took me a long time to be able to get get my juju on. I got about the uh, spiders again. So anyhow, I have a feeling that there are some of you out there like that, too. So Gary's put up a poll. And... I think you have. Have you? There you go. Go ahead and click on your screen. Why are you here tonight? Choose as many as you want. Yeah, just put your pointer over it and click it. It'll come on. Um, why are you interested in spiders? I love them. Want to learn more? I hate them. Want to learn more? They're creepy but interesting. I want to know about venomous spiders in the Southwest. And I can't read the one on the bottom. It's cut it off for some reason. I can't see oh, it. There it is. I want to know how to keep them out of my house. I know we have at least one person who feels that way. She told me. So 13 out of the 15 have come and called in. Um, let me go ahead and end the polls and, I can't. and share the results. So most of you thought they are creepy but interesting. A few of you, and then it was pretty well shared throughout. Okay. Well, we're going to be talking about a lot of these different things. And, Gary, you can close it now. Mm -hmm. And can everybody check your microphones again? And please make sure you're muted because it get, makes a lot of background noise and uh, for everybody. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today, what is a spider? You know, a lot of folks don't really know. Which ones live here, the ones that you're most likely to see out in your yard or in your home, and which ones don't, which is even more important to a lot of you. And there's a lot of myths out there just floating around waiting to be either picked up by somebody and run with it or for some really cool people to debunk. So let's move on. The reason we're going to talk about it, spiders truly are the good guys. They, they do a lot of good things for us. And they, they are really cool, the different things that they can do, and we'll be talking about it. And one of the things that we do want to do is give you practical advice to avoid, avoid getting bitten and to help you to keep the spiders out of your house if you don't want spiders in your house. I personally am of the opinion that spiders may live in my house if I can't see them. And if I do see them, they are no longer welcome. But, and that's not a good attitude because they're there for a reason. There are over 43,000 identified species of spiders in the world, and about 3,400 of them live here. And wherever you find insects, you're going to find spiders living close by because they kind of co-evolve together. If they're spiders, you're going to have, they have to have food. It's their buffet, so they grew up right alongside the insects that provide that food. All spiders have venomous they have mouth parts that have venom because that's how they subdue their, their prey. And in the Pacific Northwest, 
only one species has been documented as being um, venomous to humans. And we'll talk about that later too. So the next question is, are spiders insects? What do you think? Gary, thank you. Put your mouse on it and click and submit. 13, a few more. 14. Anybody else going, going, gone. Okay. There you go. See, I gave it away, didn't I? They aren't, the spiders are not insects. Okay, Gary. They're arachnids. And spiders are as different to insects as birds are to fish, believe it or not. There are a lot of differences. Spiders have two body parts, as you can see here. They've got the cephalothorax, which is the head and the chest kind of mixed together, and an abdomen. They have four pair of legs, and these are just some of the difference, differences. These are not antennae. These are called palps. And this is an insect. Three body parts, head, thorax, and abdomen, and it has three pair of legs, and they have antennae. Most of them also have wings, and spiders don't. They don't need them. They can get around other ways. And, again, these are the pedipalps. The eyes are in front, like on the side of their head. A lot of times you, you can only see them by looking at the top and the sides of their head, but we'll show you that in another picture. What you're seeing here from the top, not very clearly, are the uh, mandibles and the chelicerae. And the chelicerae are the parts of the spider that have the fangs, which are like hypodermic needles. Here's another view, looking straight on. And believe me, it's really hard to get these under a microscope because you lay them there like this, you can't tilt them up to the microscope to see them very clearly. One of the ways um, that we look at them is we look at their eyes. They usually have an eye on the front, a, a pair of eyes on the front, and then some around the side. Usually eight, sometimes six, and there are rare cases where there are no eyes at all. But the front eyes are the ones that that are used for actually seeing, and the other ones are just for peripheral vision. It's pretty clip, pretty clever. Uh, the insects are the ones that have the segmented eyes. So you can see the pedipalps here. They are used um, in, in both male and female to help hold their prey. In the male, if you look closely at a spider, if you see little boxing glove type things, little swollen areas on the end of those, those are the uh, male sex organs. Pretty slick, actually. And this is a crab spider. This is one of Gary Hinterman's very favorites. How do they eat? Well, their mouth parts act like a short straw. They, their digestive juices are secreted from the chelicerae. That's the venom. And, and it helps to digest. It helps to break apart the, um, whatever prey it is. And once it gets in there into the prey, they suck up the liquefied food. And it's... It's a little bit of everything that was in that uh, insect, and it, it makes it shrink up to practically nothing. And spider poo, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I see it quite frequently in my basement where I really try not to go to clean. They're always in the corners. I see these little specks of um, white stuff, almost like paint, real tiny specks of paint on my floor. It's a, um, you know, it's a wood floor. And it's really hard to clean up. It's a it's spider poo. It's uric acid and waste, and the color is white. So how do they hear and taste and smell and communicate and climb? They don't have ears, but they've got a lot of other things. They hear with the hairs on their body, and they're very, very sensitive to touch and vibration. Each hair is like a single independent ear. And think about trying to coordinate that. You know, we have enough trouble trying to figure out if, if a sound is coming toward us or away from us or coming from right or left. And they've got all these hairs all over their bodies, and each one of them is acting like a separate ear. The hairs also taste 
chemical compositions and what they touch. You know, is this going to be a good bug, you know, or is this a girl? They're still not sure if they're actually be able to smell, taste, whatever um, pheromones that they know that it's a, a female of their species. And uh, it would be interesting to see if they're, they would be able to tell a girl and boy just by the pheromones, that, but ongoing uh, research is necessary for that. We'll look again at one of the pictures a little bit later, but they've got little brushes on their feet to help them climb. They don't work on slick sur surfaces. Um, I have a couple of pets. Well, they aren't pets. They kind of live in my bathroom in the corner, and I don't do anything with them. They're little jumping spiders. They're very sweet. They, they're kind of cute. I don't mind them. I mean, they're like, oh, I don't know, less than a quarter of an inch long. And every once in a while, one of them will swing themselves on a little web into my sink and they cannot get out they they climb they come then they slide back down again because those brushes don't work on slick surfaces so what do spiders eat a lot of insects they eat whatever is available in their environment the web making spiders are really cool they catch their prey with a web but not all of them do hunting spiders ambush them every spider uh, species uh, genus has its own way of catching its prey. Some of them hide in a little hole in the ground and pop out when something comes by. Some of the sheet web spiders will, and the funnel web spiders will hide in a funnel and they've got this trampoline-like structure of a web outside and nobody can see them, no siree, but when something jumps or steps on that web and wiggles it, they're out there and that insect is toast. Spiders that live in houses are, are different than the ones that live outside. Um, they've learned how to live in dry places that don't have a whole lot of water, very little humidity and very little water, and not a lot to eat. So they are not equipped to being outside. A lot of them, with their webs, they put a, the silk that they spin from their spinnerets, and I think I forgot to show you the spinnerets. Spinnerets are back here at the back of their body, at the end of the, um, the, ab the abdominal segment. That's where the webs are made. And with that, they do sev several things. They can make a protective covering of silk for their eggs. They can, like I said, make that silken tunnel where they hide. Some of them just make a little retreat. Some capture prey using the web like orb weavers, and we'll talk about that. One of the coolest things they do is ballooning. If you've ever seen baby spiders in the springtime on the side of your house, uh, I've got a great video of that. I should have had it there. You see this tiny little clump of dark stuff, and you go look at it, and you think, oh, my gosh, those are baby spiders. And there must be thousands of them in a, oh, I don't know, like a three-inch uh, square section of, you know, your side of your garage, a warm side of your garage. And if you disturb them, they all scatter, and then they all go back into the place. But when they're ready to go, they'll spin a, a little web, and the air will catch them, and it'll take them a lot of different places so, that's so that they all don't end up in the same place and, and compete. So why are there spiders in your house? It's because you've set a table for them. I mean, we all have insects in the house. And, you know, those white specks I see on my floor in my basement, that means that they've been eating the insects that are down there. So that's a good thing. And, and that's just in the house. If they're outside, they do an amazing job out in your garden. In fact, there are some of the crab spiders are kind of evil little buggers. They'll get on your flowers and they, and we'll talk about this later, but they'll even catch the good guys. They'll catch some of the pollinators and eat them too. But for the most part, I think they probably get more of the uh, pest insects than the beneficials. Okay. You can, this is true or false. You can ID a spider by looking at the spider and then going into a book or getting on the internet and comparing its appearance to the, a photo. What do you think? This, by the way, is anonymous. We don't know what you're answering, so you can answer whatever you want. Fourteen of you, fifteen of you. 
Last chance going, going. About 50-50. Ah, okay. Well, you know, it's really not true. You can't because, because of a variety of reasons. One of the ways, that, the main way that people that are arachnologists are able to identify spiders is by comparing very small pieces, little bits of their anatomy to what, what actually turns out to match things, match body parts that are uh, specific to that species. We tell families of spiders, uh, there's probably about 114 families of spiders and about 30 in a given area. And we look at eye arrangements, um, the arrangement of the hairs on their body, uh, the claws at the end of their legs. Um, we look at their genitalia, especially the females, especially with hobo spiders. There are a lot of different things that we look at. If you've ever looked at a jumping spider, they've got these headlights. I mean, they are right out there in front. They are the cutest little things. Um, the primary eyes, like I said, are always right in the center, and they have the best vision. If you want to do something fun with your kids, the, the side eyes have a reflective coating on the inside. And if you go outside at night in bushes with a flashlight, the eyes will reflect the light, like, you know, when you're driving up the road and you catch an um, insect or a animal at the side of the road, like a cat or something, it reflects off them. You'll see a whole bunch of spiders out there that you never knew were there. The hobo spider and all the ones in that family have this arrangement. They're like dominoes. we got the four here and then the two off to the side. And so when we're, somebody brings us a spider into the plant insect clinic, we, we get them drunk with the alcohol, and then we get them under the scope so we can see how the eyes are arranged. Because they're pretty small. I'll bet you've never seen spider eyes unless you've really, really looked. But um, once we see that arrangement, we know that it's in that family, the uh, eritigi eritigina family. And this is a wolf spider. They're kind of cute, too. Big eyes. Jumping spiders, though, are supposed to have the best eyesight of all. And they recently discovered one of the huntsman spiders that doesn't have any eyes. It was found in a, a cave that was completely dark, and it evolved with absolutely no eyes. You can see where the eyes are supposed to have been. You Look at the jaws on this. Great mandibles here, and these are the chelicerae right there. And those are the hypodermic needles where the venom is injected. And this is just some of them. So we get, we get these under the um, scope and we look at them. So if I'm not mistaken, this here is the eritigina, which is the hobo spider and the giant um, house spider. This would be that wolf spider that we looked at with the two big ones and then the four smaller ones. And this is the jumping spider. So... Spiders are easy to identify? Nope. These are both the same spider. Same spider. Not, you know, it's the same spider on a different day. This is a crab spider, and it's a, I think it's a golden, it's the goldenrod crab spider. They ambush predators and lay on weight in flowers, and they change their color to blend in with their environment. And it can take three or four days, sometimes even longer, for them to change to the same color as the, uh, flower, but they can do it, and they just, they're very patient, they just kind of sit there and sit there until some unsuspecting insect comes by and they grab it. The males look completely different from the females. I think I have a picture of that. Let me see. This is the male of the, of the crab spider. They're usually much smaller than the female, as you can see there, and drab. Let me go back. Okay, I guess I already talked about that. But the other thing is the identifying markings of a lot of spiders aren't always present, and the color varies. If you look up, if you want to see a bunch of different spiders, go to bugguide.net. That's B-U-G-G-U-I-D-E dot net. And look up, look up hobo spider if you want to. 
they, you'll see anything from absolutely no markings on the, the, the body to all kinds of different markings. And they are all the same spider. What you have to look at in, in those is their, uh, their eyes to make sure you're in the right family. Then you turn it over on its, your, on its back and you look at the uh, breastplate, the sternum. And another thing you look at for the females is uh, their genitalia because it's completely different from the other um, members of the same species. So you can't tell just by looking at a picture. There's a lot of things that go into it. Alice? Yes. Alice, what was the name of the site? B-U-G-G-U-I-D-E dot net. Okay. It's, a, it's a great site. I mean, they've got every, every insect, I think, in the world there. So, are all spiders dangerous? Well, not really, but all spiders do use venom to incapacitate their prey. And their prey is significantly, well, usually significantly smaller than, than, than they are. And mo believe it or not, most spiders' fangs aren't even big enough to penetrate our skin. So most of our fear is completely unfounded. And a lot of times when they do bite us, they're dry bites and they don't bother wasting their venom on us because they know we're too big. And most bites are accidents. We surprise them. And it's our fault, not theirs. Um, have you ever not been wearing gloves and stuck your hand into a corner, gotten a spider bite? That's, you know, or uh, one time I put on a shirt and didn't realize there was a spider in it. And, you know, what's the spider do? He's scared. I learned a long time ago that if I have, I have my garden boots outside in the garage. If they've been sitting there for any length of time at all, I shake them out and then I step on them because I don't want to stick my foot into them and accidentally trap a spider. I don't think they could get through to my socks, but this girl's not taking that chance. Now, I know I'm going to get an argument from some people. We always do. There are no brown recluse spiders in Washington, regardless of what your doctor told you, what your friend told you. There are no brown recluse spiders in Washington. One perhaps might have come in on a car or something like that, but they could not set up a, a colony here, and they would perish. They, they just really aren't set up for this, this part of the world. The ones, the brown recluse that we're talking about, the species, this is where they live. There are other ones here that, that aren't considered, they're, um, they're also recluses, they're different recluses, but they're, they apparently don't have as much of the toxic, they're not as toxic to humans as the other ones are. And now we're going to get to the one everybody's wondering about. What about the dreaded hobo spider? You know, this is some one that people love to hate. Um, but the hobo spider venom is no more dangerous than any other. I bet you every single one of you has seen these horrible pictures on the Internet that they swear was from a spider bite. But I'm here to tell you that there are some folks out there that are very sensitive to spiders, some that are very you know, sensitive to any kind of insect bite. I have a, when my sister was a little girl, she would get a, she would get a mosquito bite on her eyelid and her whole side of her face would shut, would swell up. She couldn't even see out of that eye. And that's from one mosquito bite. Um, I'm allergic to bee stings. And when I get that, I get one of those, when I get a bite, I get one of those necrotizing wounds like they show come from a spider. And I had one that was about the size of, of a quarter one time. And luckily, I didn't get it infected because a lot of people do, and that's where the flesh-eating spider bite thing comes from. It's not the spider bite itself. It's usually a secondary infection. So the most common spiders we see are the big giant house spiders, and they are huge. Some, some of them are, um, if you get a small saucer, they can be up to like fill the, fill the mason jar lid. The bodies are about an inch long and then the legs, if you spread them out, will fill a, the, a mason jar lid. That's how, how big they are. When you see a spider that big, it's almost absolutely assured 
not to be a hobo spider. But like we said, it doesn't matter. They're, they're no more poisonous than any other. Hobos are really small compared to that. And here's another one. So, what do you think about this question? Can doctors can tell a spider from the bite if it's a if it's a bite from a spider, Gary? Thirteen people, fifteen people, going, going, gone. Wow. Everybody got, said no. Wow. Way to go. You're absolutely right. They're getting a little bit better at it, but they still can't tell for sure unless you saw it happen. So, there are two criteria that have to be met. Somebody has to actually see a spider bite happen, and then you have to have an expert that actually has to identify the spider species. And we, you know, at the Master Gardener uh, Plant and Insect Clinic, we're getting pretty good at identifying the species. We can't, well, the genus maybe, not necessarily the species, but we can get pretty close. We can tell you if it's a hobo or a giant house spider. We can tell you if it's a wolf spider. We can tell you if it's a... Um, a black widow or a false widow. But again, some sensitive people may react really strongly to any kind of a bite. But most of those pictures you've seen on the internet are caused by MRSA, that methylene or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. That's that flesh eating uh, infection that people can get usually from a hospital situation. And it's so common that they call it in the medical circles a false spider bite diagnosis. And some people will tell you, well, my doctor said it's a spider bite. And I, I won't get into it with them, but the doctor doesn't know. He, he didn't see it. Um, and another thing, just because you have that spider in your house doesn't mean that that boo you have on your hand came from that. You've got a lot of other things in the house, too, and the spiders are there to eat them. So let's, does anybody have any questions about that? Look, I'd like to make a comment, Alice. Yeah. One of the things that when, when we talk about the master gardeners can identify them, that's because the spiders have been put in the refrigerator or oh, yeah. that they're cold, they're not moving, they're under the scope. But just to be able to look at a spider for the most part, it's, it's hard to identify them. So when Alice talks about being able to identify they've got something that's not moving, it's under the scope, where you can really see it. Unless it moves when it's under the scope, which I hope that never, ever happens again. But it's actually fascinating looking at the tiny little body parts. It really is. Remember what I told you about the um, palps, how a male looks like he's got um, little boxing gloves on the end of the palps? You see how that's kind of thickened there? And on the female over here, there's no thickening in the end, so we know that's a female. And this is the relative size of the hobo to the giant house spider. The hobo is very small. And look how similar it is otherwise, though. One of the I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into it because it will bore you, but this spider right in here is on its back. One of the things we look at is the breastplate right here. And if we could magnify that, we would see six or eight little beige circles on either side, you know, four here and four here. If we turned the hobo spider over, this area here would just be blank. That's one of, that's the quickest way that we can see to find it. If, um, if we don't see that, then we go look at the other body parts. Cobweb spiders. These are some of the spiders that you will see in, in Washington here. This is the black widow. And I don't know how many of you didn't realize this, because I sure didn't. I always thought that the, the, um, the red hourglass was on the top of the spider. It isn't. It's underneath. And this is the black male black widow. And it looks completely different from the female. It's smaller. And its venom is not considered a problem at all. The cobweb, it, it's a cobweb. It has a very messy web, like you can see. Some of the cobweb spiders will drop lines of 
elastic silk from it to capture their uh, prey that way. Black widows are much more common on the eastern side of the Cascades, but we have seen them here in western Washington. But they're very shy spiders, and they they won't come out. You'll have to really surprise them. You you stick your hand into a corner, you know better. You stick your hand into a corner without gloves, you could get bitten by something. This one is really cool. This is one of the uh, folding door spiders. This part of the web or uh, the nest is actually hidden in the ground and it's vertical. So the, the spider hides in there and the trap door is shut. So you can't even see it. I mean, it's, it's just about invisible. And when the spider senses prey out there, he pops up, grabs it, takes it in there and he has dinner. It's pretty cool. And funnel weavers, this is what the, um, the uh, giant house spider and uh, I can't think of the other ones, the hobo and there's another couple that are in the same family. Th this is a grass spider. You see how similar that looks to the other two that we looked at. But they hide in there. Um, I think the funnel is right here. And when something walks across their web, they jump out and get it because they're invisible down there. Nobody can see them. And they're probably one of the most common spiders that we see. I don't know about you, but I go out sometimes early in the morning with my cat and I, you know, the dews on the, the, the ground cover and on my, the grass and on my, my um, shrubs out there. And I can see sheep spiders like that all over everything. Wolf spiders. I think they are so cute. Wolf spiders are very nice. They, have, they carry their babies on the back after they... Um, after they're born. If you find one moving toward a burrow, crevice, instead of a web, it's probably a wolf spider. They're not really big. They're usually like one and three eighths, like three to four millimeters, not very big. And the males are um, about 19 millimeters long, not three to four, 34 millimeters. Um, they, they're the ones that you see carrying this white egg sac. I've seen a lot of those, and I, I guess I didn't realize it was a wolf spider when I saw it. But after the eggs hatch, they carry the babies on the back for a while. The wolf spiders usually hunt both day and night, and they're really, really fast. If you see one moving fast and don't know, didn't get a good chance to look at it, chances are it's a wolf spider. And they're outdoor spiders. All the ones that we've been talking about here are outdoor spiders, except for the cobweb spiders and the... Um, the giant house spiders. These are jumping spiders, my favorite. They're one of the largest and most diverse families. Um, they are pretty small, like I told you, and they have a lot of hair on their legs. They've got good eyesight, and they're usually daytime hunters that stalk or ambush their prey. And then they pounce on them and, and inject venom through their fangs. Many of these species don't spin actual webs, but will use silk to drop down and grab their prey. And if they catch them, they'll reel themselves back up into their um, retreat and have dinner. I'll bet you've all seen orb weavers outside this time of year. This is in my backyard. It, it, they are just beautiful. This is the one we see mostly right here in, in our area. It's the cross orb weaver. Now, I saw this in a book one time, and they're saying this is the cat face spider, and for the life of me, I couldn't see why they were calling it that. You cougar fans, ears, eyes, snout, and mouth. Is that cool or what? They're one of the spiders that actually catch usually flying insects. Um, I had these this year on my... Uh, my flower baskets, and I had noticed a couple weeks earlier that I had a mild infestation of aphids. And aphids, if there are too many of them, they become winged, a winged version of themselves. And there must have been a hundred of them caught in that net. It was great. I should have taken a picture of it to show you. But that just goes to show you they're very useful. They eat, fun they get catch fungus nets there too. These are cellar spiders. They're they're very fragile looking. They've got small bodies and very, very long legs, and they make really, really messy webs, and they live on the ceilings and 
garages and cellars and you, those are the ones that kind of blonde color and they you'll see them in the corners they eat other spiders including hobos and the giant house spiders you wouldn't think so but they could do that and they're the kind that my sister who had that colored hair when she was a kid my brother used to tell her you've got a spider in your hair and she couldn't see it oh, he was he was just so mean Okay, here's another one. All arachnids are spiders. Well, that's just not the case. We only picked the myths here that you chances are you've heard about. There are some really weird myths out there, and at the end, I'm going to send you to a website where you can look at all the other myths because they will boggle your mind. Spiders are arachnids, but not, ar not all arachnids are spiders because uh, scorpions, mites, and ticks are also arachnids. They all have eight legs and no antennae, but they are not spiders. They all belong to insects and spiders belong to are, are all arthropods, which means that they are jointed legs. So when we talk about arthur instead of insect identification, we use the, the uh, umbrella term arthropod identification because that includes spiders and, well, arachnids and insects. But you can see how different they are, but they all belong to the same um, arachnid group with eight legs and no antennae. Okay, I think I've already covered this, but let's try it anyway. Gary, Paul. Whoops. All spiders make webs. True or false? Eleven. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay. Going, going, gone. Everybody said false. Oh, you guys have been listening. Thank you. Okay. They can do they do a lot of different things with their uh, with their webs. We talked about the uh, trapdoor spiders, and some of them use them as a drag line. Some of them use them for ballooning. Okay. Here's some that don't make webs. The crab spider has no reason to. She's just kind of sitting there in the uh, flower. Ground spiders don't need to. They live in the ground. And these are the ones that use drag lines. This one makes a retreat for itself. It'll grab a prey and run back into it. And this is what the sheet web spiders look like. Very similar to funnel webs, but without the funnel. Cobweb spiders are very messy. And then we see the orb weaver, weaver uh, spider webs. Here's a good one. What time of year are there more spiders? Gary? Spring, summer, or late summer, fall? Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay. Most people said late summer, fall. I can see why you'd say that, but that's not actually true, believe it or not. There's actually more in um, spring and early summer. But we see a whole lot more, don't we? That's because a lot of them are getting bigger and more mature. And especially the ones that we see are the orb weavers and the giant house spiders. And the males are out there frantically looking for mates because it's time. They are the ones that mate right now. And the females are just huge right now. And when their ab abdomens are big like that, they're, they're actually, they've got the eggs there and they're, they're getting ready to um, to lay them. Somebody bored? Somebody should uh, <laughs> mute their mic. It'll put me to sleep. Okay, it seems like there are more, but there aren't. And this is actually what you see here. There's more in May and June than there are in August and September. So they do. They eat their their uh, prey in a lot of different ways. We've talked about that. They do digest part of the prey, not just the juices, they will suck up body parts too, and they actually can start 
from the outside of the body. Anne was lucky enough to see a spider capture a, very quickly capture a stink bug, which we don't like, right? And uh, just a couple hours later, it was sucked dry. A spider will actually vomit digestive fluid over the prey. That's how they start the um, digestive process. And when the prey is chewed with those jaws that we saw and the fluid is sucked back into the mouth, they'll sometimes get a lot of meat in that process. So they know how to do it. This is a rove beetle. This is a rove beetle afterwards, after the, um, cross the orb weaver spider got it. And those large hairy spiders I find in my house must be wolf spiders. Big and hairy doesn't mean wolf. We saw the eyes on the, um, the wolf spider, and we also know that they move quickly and that they will run out and catch something and go hide again. And they're very small, and um, the large hairy spiders are probably the giant house spiders. That's what our um, experience has been. This is the relative size of a wolf spider to a house spider. Giant house spider, I should say. When black widows mate, the female always kills and eats the male. Not true. It happens a lot of times in labs because, you know, the males don't have anywhere to go. Um, but male cannibalism has never been observed in the wild. That being said, there are some, when, when they mate, the, the female will stick her um, claws into the male's abdomen to hold her there. To hold them there. But regardless of what happens after mating, the males usually don't live very long afterwards. They, they live to mate and then they die pretty much. Now, this one freaked me out when I saw it because it happens to be one myth that I have never heard before. Baby spiders can hatch out of wound, bite wounds. Nope, spiders don't find the human suitable for laying eggs. Um, I've never heard that urban legend. So, uh, somebody else will say that there's a friend of a friend who went to a dentist with a tooth sore, and when the dentist probed her mouth, tiny spiders hurried out. Nope, not true. The Internet is a really great place for passing on uh, misinformation, as we all know. So you've got spiders in your house. You don't like them there, so you should be spraying them, right? Probably not. They, they're predators and they don't really infest things. They're there because they, they're something to eat. Um, the sudden increases are temporary and usually due to the mating season. Because they are your exterminator, why would you exterminate your exterminator? A better way to catch them if, if you don't want them in your house is to use sticky traps. It'll, um, it will catch them and you can you know, dispose of them that way. For a insecticide to work, it actually ha you have to spray it on the spider. With with other insects, all they have to do is walk on it, and it will get them. So, so sticky traps are better, but what's even better is preventing them from coming into your house in the first place. So porch lights attract insects, right? You turn on the porch light, you open the door, you get a million bugs in, and then the f spiders follow because that's where the dinner is, fast food, right? So leave your porch lights off when you open the door. And, and this recommendation here will help keep an awful lot of insects out of your home. Caulk around any potential openings, like where the electric and the plumbing come into your home, um, the spaces around the windows. That'll keep out any number of insects. Um, inspect sp spider or firewood, because you have often seen, I'm sure, egg sacs on those and vacuum webs from corners and crawl spaces. So, which one of these daddy long legs is a spider? Gary? This is a trick question. We have 12 people, uh, a few more are not sure. 12 people have voted. Any more? Five more seconds. Okay, about 50-50 for B and C. Okay. Um, 
this is one of those situations where scientific names really point out the true species. This is a crane fly, and a lot of people grew up calling that a daddy long legs. This is a cellar spider. Remember that one I told you had a very fragile looking body and, and blonde and it has the, the delicate little legs? That's, some people also call that a daddy long legs. It's a spider. It's got two body parts, a cephalothorax and an abdomen. This is a harvestman, the one that I grew up calling daddy long legs. And if you look at this, that's one body part. Everything else looks alike. Do you guys remember that old urban legend that said that the daddy long legs, this one, the harvestman, is the most toxic spider in the world, but it can't bite you because it has a very small mouth? None of that's true. It doesn't have fangs. It's, it's not even a spider. It's kind of in a class by itself. So you can wow your friends with that. Oops. I'm not able to move my, hang on. Okay, there we go. And, and it, it also doesn't have silk, so let's, there we go. Okay, and that myth, I talked about that. Those are the um, harvestmen, aren't they cool? That's Gary Hinderman's favorite picture in the world. So the spider you found has to be one you've already heard of. Nope, there are just way too many of them. Look at that, the red-faced banana spider. I have never seen one of those, but I know people that have. Again, you can see its eye formation. You can see the jaws. You can't see the cholesterol, the, the um, hypodermic needles there. But you can see the palps and then the legs. Experts have to identify spiders under very high magnification and there are so many different spiders and yeah you can get some individual spiders that travel in your belongings or something but they don't live here and here's one that's pretty pervasive I know a friend of mine um, her boyfriend picks up any spider he sees in the house because she does not like spiders in the house and she and he puts them outside granted they live in Australia and I and I have visited her several times I have never seen spiders that size <laughs> she she told me a story but I I reached in she says pull that book out of that bookcase and I did and there I I swear there was a spider back there that was the size of my hand she's an arachnophobe she is terrified of spiders because of the size of them but anyhow Spiders that have evolved to live in the house should not go outside. They'll die. And spiders that have wandered into the house won't do well in your house either. Now, the, it, there's a, an exception to this rule. If you see one of the, the um, a wolf spider come into your house, you can take it out because it just wandered in. So anyway, they, they just can't live in, in the, the outdoor spiders can't live indoors and the indoors can't live out. Male or female, what do you think? I'd say it's male, looking at the boxing gloves here. Those you can see with your bare eyes, so you can amaze your friends that you can tell whether it's a male or female. Most house spiders aren't seen outside. And they move into new houses as egg sacs attached to our possessions. And I, for one, have seen them. And they usually spend their entire life cycle in that building because, really, where else are they going to go? And most of the ones that you see in your house haven't been outside. It's just these wanderers in the um, fall. So I think I've already answered this, but let's see if you were paying attention. Gary, why do spiders come indoors in the fall? Because the weather is getting colder, because they wander in looking for mates. Fourteen, fifteen. Most people thought they wandered in looking for mates. All righty. 
and they are right because this is that time of year. You know, you can still find on some pretty reputable websites that say that they wander in when they're, you know, because the weather's getting cold outside, and that's just not the case. Um, okay, we are almost at the end, really close. Okay, so spiders become less active or dormant in the winter sometimes, and 95% of the spiders have never been outside. We said that already. Here's a really good little book. It's, it's one of those golden books. It's small. It's um, like, oh, I don't know, about five by four by five inches, but it's really good for the spiders that live around here. And WSU has a really nice book. By the way, I'm going to be putting this on our website so you can go back and look at it. It'll be at, um, somebody want to type that in, uh, chat, collitscomg.com forward slash looking ahead. That's where you'll be able to find this entire presentation. Um, this is a really good book, too. It talks about all the ones that live here specifically. This is the one you really have to go see. This is the Burke Museum Spider Myths. His name is the the fellow who does that is an arachnologist called Rob Crawford. He came down and talked to us master gardeners a few years ago, and that guy really knows his spiders. And his website has more myths than I ever knew existed about spiders. And he tears them apart one by one, and I think you'd be amazed at it. I think you'd enjoy it, really. If you're here at this talk, you would really enjoy that website. So I'm going to, like I said, I'll make this available to you um, on the website, so make sure you go back and look at it. And that's all I've got. <laughs>